Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all, whoever is all here. It doesn't tell me, so I'm not even sure. But I am Tracy Castles, PhD, and I'm the founder of Evolutionary Parenting. And I'm assuming you're here because you, like me, are the parent of an orchid child. Um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. If anyone wants to make a comment, let me know that you can actually hear what I'm saying because I'm as many of you know, technologically inept, that would be great. Um, and I've never streamed to YouTube before. So even though it's the same service technology, um, I'm not entirely sure that it will be working properly. So we'll see. Um, today I have 45 minutes and I wanted to go through some of the questions that people have about orchidness. So if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the comments and I will have it and load it. But I want to start first off by talking a bit about what it is to be an orchid because so many families aren't sure it's a term they've heard of some people think it's exactly the same as like a highly sensitive person or a high needs baby and the fact of the matter is is that although we may be talking about the same person or the same construct in some cases there's a lot of reason to believe that it's not the same in all cases so Let's start with what is an orchid child? Just for those of you that are here going, I'm not sure I have an orchid child, but maybe I do. Um, hopefully this will answer that question for you. So orchids are children that like the orchid flower are highly susceptible to their environment, which means that unlike other children who are generally defined as dandelions, they are um, their well-being is far more dependent upon the nurturing or the environment that they find themselves in as opposed to their nature, how they're born, uh, the temperament they have, etc. So how they are raised, the environment in which they find themselves is incredibly important to their well-being. And like an orchid, it's not necessarily a perfect environment that we're looking for, but rather a very specific environment. And that can be really hard for parents to ascertain. I think too often we get worried that we are thinking about um, the the perfect environment. We're supposed to shield them from everything and so on. And, and that's not really the case. So when it comes to orchidness, we're talking about children who are affected by their environment far more than others. Now, how do you know if you have an orchid? Well, Generally, you probably won't know for sure, because as I've said in other talks and elsewhere, you have to take your kid in to get tested. So there are studies that look at their stress reactivity and children who have stress reactivity in the upper echelon, and it's usually the top 20 percent, it's 15 to 20 percent in each study, um, are labeled orchids. And it's because their stress reactions to mild to moderate stressors tend to be far and above what other people have. So that's why we're talking about you know, the stress reactivity as the key feature. So although spectra, there is a spectrum um, of these traits and our stress reactivity, these kids tend to be on the upper end. And this means one of the first things we notice in our own children is how reactive they are. So these are the kids that tend to be, when they separate from us, very distressed, and this can happen very young, which is why we get people linking it to the high needs baby. Um, those kids that need to be in constant proximity, because part of that stress reactivity is also a lack of regulation more generally in a physiological sense. So we're talking about things like breathing, heart rate, temperature. These are things that they can struggle with. And so having uh, people that regulate for them through being close and touching, we actually do that physiological regulation through something that is called uh, synchrony. And all babies have it, but our orchids are a bit more reliant upon it for a bit longer than our other children are. So that highly reactive nature is there. In the research, there seems to be a link to kind of this fussier, more difficult temperament. However, I wanna counter that by saying that a lot of the families that I've worked with who definitely have orchids later would say in the baby time, their babies were thrilled, happy. They were the happiest little kids they'd ever seen. And I think this comes from a mismatch. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you give birth to an orchid and your orchid has you who is utterly responsive, is going to wear them, you're going to co-sleep, you're going to do all these things that regulate them, help them feel safe, they're not going to be fussy. They're going to be very, very happy and, and 
they're going to thrive in that environment at that stage in their lives. Whereas if they have these more difficult times, they may have parents that want to do things more mainstream or are being told they need to do things differently, putting their babies down more, separating, building that independence. That's not really going to work for them. So that is where we get this kind of dichotomous behaviors for these babies at that time and their, their outcomes. So not everyone sees their child as an orchid early on, although later when they start seeing the stress reactivity to newer scenarios, it can become a lot more pronounced. So that's one of the things that comes up. The other is awareness. Orchids seem to be highly aware of their environment. And this goes actually probably to that stress response. So when we experience stress, we become highly attuned to everything happening around us. And the more supportive the environment, the better it is for us. The worse it is, the worse it is for us. So our kids, by the very nature of their stress response, seem to be uh, aware of what's happening all around them. But even without being stressed, they seem to be quite aware of what's going on around them. So ask any parent of an orchid. They are, you know, superhuman hearing, listening to what's happening two rooms away, uh, memories for for everything that's gone on in the past. And that is something that um, that is really important for people to realize. So that is, I think, the key features of the orchid. Uh, so if you are questioning if you have one, if you're in the first year of life, um, you may, you may not. I mean, some people feel they know it right away and others won't notice it because there is a lot of very typical baby behavior, like needing to be comforted, wanting to be close, that is normal for all babies. This is not something that is weird. However, a lot of babies, say six, seven months, you can put them down or they can go to strangers without an intense fear. Um, some of these other things crop up later, but it may take time for you to notice your orchid uh, is an orchid and that's okay as well. So I wanna get to the first question here that I have is from a first time mom, Jessica. Hello and welcome. Um, she says, I have nothing to compare it to because she is a first time mom, but how do I distinguish between biologically typical behavior versus orchid behavior? And that is an Excellent question. Um, she follows up by adding that her toddler needs so much help to sleep and can't ever be away from me. So I would say that, okay, right off the bat, sleep is going to be something that orchids struggle with. And I can talk about that in a bit more depth in a moment. But what is biologically typical behavior? Well, it's kind of hard to assess fully because our culture is not biologically typical. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when we look at how we structure the family diet, our expectations for kids, these are not matching biological needs. So I think we may have some behaviors that come up and seem orchid when it may not be, and it may be a feature of our environment. However, all that said, I do think these struggles happen far more for parents of orchids than they do for other kids. That level of um, resilience, and I hate that word because it's something that's built up, but there does seem to be a bit more of an innate resilience to these separations, to um, handling these struggles that come up, is more typical in non-orchid children. And orchids will have a really hard time with that. And they are very attachment focused to their primary care. And I'll explain that a bit just because I think it's really important to understand why. And my reading of the research on this uh, stems from the stress response. And when our babies are born, all babies have intense stress responses to the world. The world is a scary, horrible place. And having a bath is stressful. Uh, we're not just talking about shots, which are, of course, stressful and how we often ascertain stress in babies. But, you know, having a bath, getting clothes on, all these things are, are physiologically difficult. And when our orchids have that, um, they, well, like all babies at first, they their stress rises quite high. And then we, as loving, caring parents, we hug them, we buffer them, and their stress drops back down. And over the span of the first few months, this creates a pattern that lets babies know they're safe. We are safe. We buffer them. None of this stress becomes what we would call toxic stress. Now, at around three or four months, we know that the majority of children 
experience what's called a period of hyporesponsivity. And this means that they will experience the same bath, the same shots, the same, all these other stressors that were highly stressful, and it no longer brings their stress up to here. In fact, their stress kind of hovers around here. So it's much lower. And then if they're comforted, it drops right back down. Um, but in a sense, their levels are so low, even if they weren't stressed, it probably would never hit toxic. And these are for mild to moderate stressors. There is a subgroup of children, however, and it is my belief that this matches directly up with the research on orchids, even though these were done in different labs, different assessments, everything. But there's approximately 20% of kids who don't get this period. They keep reacting way up here. And how do we assess orchidness? Stress reactivity, right? They present them with a stress stressful situation, most kids respond here, some go way up here. And this is, you know, how we start figuring out. So over time, instead of experiencing life through this lens of minor stress, our orchids continue to experience it through massive stress. And they need us to buffer it. And when we buffer it, what happens is they don't, it takes a lot longer to learn that the event is safe, but they very quickly learn we are safe. We are the people that can take care of them. And this can lead to a very strong sense of neediness, clinginess, um, separation anxiety. So we see a lot of separation anxiety in orchids. Uh, and, and these are the things that kind of come out. So that never being away from you is certainly something that matches with what we know about the orchids. Now, Jessica's added in here too, that she wonders if her toddler was able to sleep better, maybe she wouldn't be considered an orchid. Um, I'm not sure about that. I don't know if you're suggesting that it's somehow sleep deprivation causing these behaviors or something like that. Uh, most, most orchids do struggle with sleep. Uh, most toddlers don't sleep very well. And so depending on what's happening, you know, with sleep, that's a whole, whole other ball game. But let's talk a bit about why our orchids need help to sleep and why sometimes that's one of the first flags that you have an orchid over anything else. So why do toddlers struggle? Well, why do toddlers struggle with sleep? There's a whole lot of answers to that. Why do orchids struggle with sleep? Let's start with the fact that when our stress is high and regularly high, it's really hard to calm enough to sleep at night. So this is something that can be somewhat difficult. Now, the second part to this is that most orchids have what we call sensory sensitivities. And that's been identified by uh, Thomas Boyce, who is the doctor who's done the majority of the work on orchids. But he highlights that there do seem to be these sensory sensitivities that go along with orchidness. And if you are sensory sensitive, as we see in children on the spectrum, as we see in children with sensory processing disorder, it makes sleep really hard because there's a lot of different things that your brain is trying to process. And if there's too much coming in, it is too much. And too much makes sleep difficult. And so depending on what that sensory sensitivity is, you may have to address that in order to help with sleep. So for example, a child who's sensory sensitive to noise, if you live in a city, you might see worse sleep because there's always noises going on around. And even things like white noise machines don't block everything. So we have to remember that the sensory sensitivity can lead to it. Or take, for example, a child who is tactile sensitive. So they don't like the feelings of seams or certain clothing. That also is going to lead to some struggle sleeping. If you think about certain pajamas, there are certain kids that can't vocalize. They're too young to tell you what is wrong. They just know they're very, very uncomfortable. And that manifests in struggles to sleep. So, and then the final part to it, and really probably, well, maybe not even the final, but one of the final parts with sleep is if we're constantly on edge, um, and this is one of the things about orchids, that being aware of all your surroundings is also a higher threat detection. And if we are always feeling somewhat threatened or on the lookout for threat, being aware of what is happening around us, we're not going to sleep well. It's really hard to get over that, especially if we don't have someone there. So co-sleeping um, or bed sharing are things that often help families of orchids because it gives that proximity. It gives that sense of safety that these kids need to be able to sleep as best as they can. Now, I can tell you that... Um, 
you know, as hard as that is, there is something that there's stuff you can do, but sleep is always going to be a bit of a struggle, at least for the first few years. And here I think about the research on when kids consolidate sleep. And there seems to be, you know, you have your your early kids that seem unicorn sleepers. I'm not sure they really, well, well they exist, but it's not a huge group, let's be honest. Um, the next group seems to consolidate around 15 months. That's not an orchid. Um, well, generally not an orchid. You can't say never. There's obviously going to be exceptions to everything, um, but is generally not an orchid. Then you have your next group, which is the majority of kids seem to uh, start consolidating in the, the early twos. And interestingly enough, it tends to coincide with the end of teething. Um, but then there's this last group where it seems to be around three and beyond. And I have found in most cases working with families, when they have an orchid, it does tend to be that later time that's going on. So that is kind of one of those things with sleep there. And I'm going to jump up. There's one question from Kate here. Do orchids ever start sleeping? My toddler is almost two and still wakes at least four to five times a night. Um, as I said, you may have to give it another year. My orchid um, does sleep now. She still has, even at 10, some sleep struggles at times in terms of that, in terms of falling asleep. Um, if her mind's going too much, she can struggle with kind of shutting it down. But generally speaking, yes, she sleeps. And it was sometime after about three that that happened. All right. So now I have Kareen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize if I am not, who says that my son is four and tends to bite his nails and pick his lips. I am picking up that he does it when stressed. Are these behaviors typical with orchid children and how can we help that? I have not read about those being specific to orchid children, but anxiety is more common in orchid children because think about the very nature of stress and threat detection. It is very much linked to higher anxiety. So that is, you know, definitely possible that it's linked to orchidness. It could be linked to other anxiety. I would certainly consider looking at those behaviors as something that you want to see as a a warning sign for you to look at the environment around your orchid um, or around your child, even if he's not an orchid, but experiencing that anxiety. Because this is not to say that kids who aren't orchid don't experience some of these same struggles. They definitely can. It's as you get older, you notice that your orchid is distinct from others. It is really their intensity is there and greater than others. Um, their struggles seem to be greater, but there are also positives to this. And I, I hope someone asks about that so that I can get to it. But um, if there are anxious, you wanna look at when that pops up, what is happening in their lives. And sometimes we don't think about the changes that are happening. So orchids tend to struggle with change a lot. And usually at certain types, it might be a change in schooling, change in caregiving, uh, presence of a new sibling. There's all sorts of things that can actually affect that. And so I hope that uh, that can make sense. So I, it is in terms of helping, I would first look at what's happening around him. Because he's four, it's going to be hard to teach him coping techniques really well now, but you certainly should start teaching ways to cope with his stress um, because that will really, really help in the long run for him because obviously the more he learns how to cope with stress in other ways, he doesn't have to revert to ways that are potentially uh, less helpful for him. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, it's... So I'm just reading here from Claire. I hope people don't mind. I'm going to show these so that people know what we're talking about. Um, so Claire says, our daughter fits every comment you're saying. It's exhausting more mentally than physically. Yes, orchids are exhausting. And I want to talk about that for a minute because that doesn't end. And I'm so sorry um, that that happens. It's I'm going to follow up with Claire's follow up here suggestions on how to support her but have family balance. So if you're the parent of an orchid, I bet you almost everyone here feels like they are almost drowning in orchidness. And it can feel like there is no room left for anything else except caring for your orchid. And in many ways, that is what it feels like. I will say the fact that she's an only child probably will help a bit. <laughs> it gets a bit harder when you start factoring in siblings. But in terms of supporting her, you know, the best support you can offer orchids 
is to help them feel confident in themselves. And that means that you have to not let your anxiety get the best of you when they're having a worse time. So when our orchids have big moments, it can be really hard to keep our cool. And I say this with someone who's been there, no judgment to any of this. It is really, really hard hard. Um, when you're surrounded by someone who may be on 11 and can't get down from that 11 for a while, then it feels intense. And when they need you, they may not want you in the moment, but they need you so intensely all the time, that can feel draining as well. So one of the things that, you know, I feel that a lot of families get into is they struggle with this idea of, of either trying to separate too much or not separating at all. And there's often a fine line. And I suggest that families try to find activities, environments, and of course, COVID's made this like impossible. So I, I totally understand this. But if you're in an area where there is something open to you, it is worth considering something like a forest school. Outdoor education and outdoor programs are excellent for orchids because nature is good for most people, but we know nature is very good for people with anxiety. And as just discussed, of course, anxiety tends to go with orchidness quite well. Um, so if you have, you know, a program that you can get her to that can help build confidence, help build relationships, help build skills at home. I think you want to make sure that she has time to do her own thing, but that you're also there as needed. Sometimes with orchids, if they sense our frustration or they sense our struggles with them, what can happen is they get even more needy. There's a, a natural inclination that we're separating away and they draw in even more because that's terrifying for them. The idea that we might not be there is truly, truly scary. So if you are able to show your orchid how much you want to be with her, as contradictory as this sounds, that can actually lessen the time she needs you. So our orchids build up their confidence by knowing we're there and knowing we want to be there so that they don't have to spend their time trying to drag us to the plate with them, if that makes sense. And so, you know, the more you set aside time every day to have one-on-one -on -one time, if you can, and really be conscientious about that time, that it is, I am so excited to spend this time with you. I, this is part of the my favorite part of the day. I love doing this. That's the kind of stuff that speaks to our orchids in ways about helping them feel safe with us. So I hope that that can answer a bit. Obviously, there's so much more. You know, you have to make sure that if she's in daycare or any other external environment, what the stress levels are like there, because the more there's stress in other areas outside the home, that is going to come home. And that's going to make it even harder for you. So hopefully let me know, Claire, if that makes sense. And maybe that can help. So let me see this. Oh, I'm disappearing there, but that's okay. How do you regulate your child when you struggle to regulate yourself? I'm probably an orchid myself and also pretty anxious myself. And she seems to pick up on this and it becomes harder to calm her. Oh yeah. That is, you know, even if you're not an orchid, although the fact of the matter is there's, there's a genetic link to orchidness. So a lot of families notice that it, it runs in the family, which is adds an added layer. Cause especially as I say, if you were an orchid that was not raised in a way that was beneficial for you, then that's going to make it even harder because you're going to be more triggered in these high intense emotions. So let's start with that because most of us orchid or not, were raised in a way that when we felt bad, we got upset. We had our big emotions. What was a common response from families was to punish because you got to learn you can't get away with that. You can't behave that way. That's not right. And there was not an acknowledgement that it was a struggle. It was treated as something bad, something wrong. And that is not how this, this is supposed to go. That, that's not what this is. Um, so our, our struggle comes often from being triggered back to how we were treated. Um, when you struggle yourself, obviously, we then behave in a way that actually does exacerbate our child's stress because we need to be their safe spot. So I always view it with an orchid or any child melting down, actually. It doesn't matter if they're an orchid or not. Your job is to regulate yourself. And I will tell you a few tricks on how to do this because orchids can be loud and it can be very hard. Um, so first off, 
there is, I recommend just sit down. Unless there's a safety issue, if it's a matter of getting someone into safety, you just do what you have to do. But if you're at home and it's safe, never chase after an orchid, never try to do anything. Just sit yourself down. If you need to, invest in noise blocking headphones. Um, I know that sounds insane, but trust me, they will be worth every penny you spend if it helps dampen the noise from you. Because again, if you're an orchid too, there are likely sensory sensitivities. And as I said earlier, you know, hearing can be one of the big ones that almost all of them have. This extra sensory hearing, hearing what's going on everywhere can make that noise that much more difficult. So we have, um, so we have that, we have the, the hearing protection, sit down and calm yourself and talk to yourself, talk yourself through it first. Just, I don't need to respond right now because you really don't. If you're there in the moment, you don't need to fix the problem right then. Your orchid is up there and I can promise you they will happily stay up there until you're ready to cope with it. So if you do nothing in that moment, except calm yourself, you will actually still have an orchid ready for you to calm. So they're waiting for you. Don't worry about it. Um, now, the second bit is that I often have to talk myself into reminding myself that, you know what? I basically am best off staying silent because our inclination is to try and reason with our orchids. We are trying to negotiate. We are trying to convince them that they should feel different than they do in that moment. And that they're either overreacting or even if we acknowledge that, okay, I get it was really hard, but that all you are saying to an orchid is, I'm upset with you for feeling this way. You shouldn't feel this way. And so you need to stop. And for an orchid, what they hear is, oh my God, I'm bad. I need to stop and I don't know how. And so what happens to the stress, instead of going down, it just continues to rise. So oftentimes saying absolutely nothing, or if you have to say anything, just say, yep, I know this is hard. Zip it leave it. The less you say, the more they can get those big emotions out, start to come down, and then you're there as they need to. So you may also add, you know what, I'm here as soon as you need me. And that's all they need to hear. And if you sit down, you become physically, the reason I say to sit down is you are physically the rock in the storm. You are that big rock out to sea, the storm is going all around you, but you are steady and you are there. And that is what our orchids need, is that steady rock there so that when that Tempest starts to kind of calm down. They're like, okay, I can go to you. And you're still there. And if you're doing anything else but being that rock, it's just adding to the storm, your wind, your whatever. I really don't know a really good metaphor for this, but I've got to work on it. Um, but that is what you're doing there. And so, you know, it can be easier. I will sit down sometimes, cover my ears, and just talk to myself about something else, remind myself, sing a song, I count, um, whatever I need to do. I don't do deep breathing because you know what, at that point, I'm actually often not regulated enough to focus on deep breathing. So I found other things, you know, sing a song, talk, talk to myself, count, all these things work to start regulating me till I can get to the stage where I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath. And then I'm here. And what you realize is a lot of that initial anxiety that comes from being with someone who is dysregulated is an urge to react to it. And we have these urges and our urge to react is outside of life and death situations um, wrong. We shouldn't have them, but we have them because of those triggers, right? So it brings back to us, it triggers back this moment where we felt like it was life and death, often as a kid, often being ignored and feeling greater threat. And so that comes up. And what we have to do is get beyond that. And when you get beyond that urge, get beyond that stress, then you start to feel better about what's happening and you're able to calm yourself. And sometimes it takes two minutes, sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it can even take 10 because it's so hard to regulate with everything else going on. But once you do get beyond that, you will feel yourself physically, okay, I got this. And then the screaming, the yelling, the upset does not seem to bother you as much. And the more you do it, the sooner that stage comes because you're training your brain to know that this is not an emergency. And then when you get there, um, you know, you get to that stage, you get back and then your orchid actually will able 
like we talked about that synchrony about how they they regulate physiologically from us when we get there suddenly they can start going down too so hopefully that answered that and um I'm going to quickly go up. I missed a question up here. I apologize here. So what's the difference between orchids and HSP, which is highly sensitive person? I found a lot more resources about the highly sensitive person, and it seems very familiar. Can you give some resources where we can find more information about orchids? So yes, these are terms that currently in the research, the highly sensitive person, if you don't know it, is by Dr. Elaine Aaron. And um, there's a whole wealth of books and everything, and there's research on it as well. Um, and there's currently a lot of research actually trying to integrate the terms because people believe they are quite similar. One difference that pops up, so we know there is something different, is that in the orchid work, which is by Dr. Thomas Boyce, and you can look him up, he's got a book called The Orchid and the Dandelion, which summarizes kind of his decades of research, what led him to it. It's brilliant. He's done TED Talks, so if you're not into reading the whole book, he's actually talked about a lot of it in that. There's a lot of different things. Um, he did a talk for the Dalai Lama uh, community in New York. I can't remember exactly what it was called. The Center for Excellence, the Dalai Lama Center for Excellence in uh, British Columbia. And there's a talk online with that. So you can look at all of those. Those are great resources. Obviously, I try to share as much as I can on evolutionary parenting. Um, you know, I have some articles. There's the freebie. If those of you that are on here haven't gotten that little free booklety handout thingy, um, you can go on and, and sign up for that via your email. Um, but that is, you know, that that's the resources. But one of the differences between the highly sensitive person and orchidness is that the highly sensitive person in the research seems to always identify about 30% of the population versus this 15 to 20 in the orchid research. And likely this is because the highly sensitive person is based on external behaviors. So we're looking at the way our children or adults behave and extrapolating back from that, that they must be sensitive X, Y, Z. So there's a, a realm of we're seeing later behaviors and assuming there's an underlying phenotype. Um, for orchids, it's based on these underlying biological processes and the, seeing how this may manifest behaviorally. And interestingly, I mean, I think it's fair to say when we look at the orchid research, how it manifests may be very different, right? So, you know, when we think about the highly sensitive person, a lot of the traits may come across as more anxious. If you're the parent of an orchid, one of the things you may notice is that whether or not you would identify them as anxious or stressed out or whatnot will be dependent upon the environment they're in. So a lot of families report that their orchid is almost, you know, two separate personalities in new environments where they may feel more threat, they may feel more stress, they may be inhibited, they may be shy, they may be nervous, they may stress out more, they may have large emotional reactions. And then when they feel safe at home with friends, um, in any environment that they're comfortable with, then they may be really rambunctious, loud, out there. They're kind of the life of the party. And you can look at these two and go, how is that the same person? Uh, but it's a reflection of how comfortable they are in the environment that they're in. So that's one of the distinctions between the two, though from some of the more recent neurological research that they've been doing, um, Dr. Lane Aaron's coupled with some other researchers that have also worked on the orchid construct. So they are working to try and identify this overlap and stuff. And we do see that, you know, it's probably quite similar, but we might be, you know, getting more people in the highly sensitive person construct due to the fact that there are still going to be people that may not be orchids, but show these traits because they're genetically predisposed to them. So hopefully that makes sense. But it's certainly something that a lot of people notice and question. Um, where it sometimes comes up is, again, this difference of orchids don't always seem to fit this, this bill of the highly sensitive person. They can have times where they do not come across as that way. So hopefully that is helpful. All right. So Jordan, sorry, I'm just going to grab a glass sip of water here. When I describe a struggle, I get the response a lot of response, I guess, from a lot of from people. Well, you just need to teach him whatever. Oh, God, yes. How can we respond to this in a way that they can understand? Um, I'm adding up here, what we've done is just to create a boundary and not talk to other people about our struggles or avoid these people altogether, which takes people out of our village. Raising an orchid 
um, without the understanding of others is hard. Um, and there isn't a lot of understanding. And there's a lot of old school ways of saying, no, 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 you just, they just need to be taught. It's that same mentality of you need to punish them, you need to harm them somehow to make them better understand. I will often say if I can to people that actually that's just not going to work. And sometimes if I can go into it, if someone's receptive, I might explain how her a stress reaction works and why would we respond with more stress? It's actually quite negative taking this, you know, one moment that could lead in a positive trajectory or a negative trajectory and making it negative. So if someone's open and sometimes I'll just start anyway and see people just glaze over and be like, you know what, just do what you're going to do. That's fine. Um, but it is, you know, you go into what stress does when we feel stressed out and so you can explain you know what they're having a struggle and they have to get that out and they need to do it in a safe way because when we get stressed we become highly affected by what happens around us so when we get punished we get harmed and when we get supported we can learn and that's the crucial they said they need to teach him yes we do need to teach our kids they cannot learn when they are stressed out and if we punish someone they remain stressed out. And not only that, when we punish people, just think about ourselves and the struggle that we talked about earlier in controlling ourselves. When we punish people, they become self-focused. They get stuck on themselves. And if we get stuck on ourselves, are we learning how to interact with others? Are we learning that this world is safe around us? No, we are intently focused on our feelings, our struggle, and just trying to cope with it in a way that is often quite unhealthy. So I often will explain if I can that no, they need to get this out. And once it's out, then down the line, maybe then or maybe later, and I often find with orchids later is better because although they calm to get their stress levels down to the point where they're really receptive may take longer. So you go down, you're like, yeah, you know what? Once she's calm, we are going to talk about it. We are going to have a discussion about what is needed, how to cope with this situation the next time it comes around. And in fact, it's that kind of teaching, if you can highlight to people, that's actually going to lead to those better outcomes down the line. Because if you think about it, if you have an orchid, part of this differential susceptibility, this um, better outcomes in a positive environment, worse in the other. And I guess I didn't really touch on this too much and hopefully people know it, but I always hate saying this because it sounds scary. Orchid children in the research, when they are in a good environment, they tend to do better than anyone else. And that means they show greater life satisfaction. They show greater emotional regulation abilities, emotional intelligence, greater health physical health, and much greater mental health. And they show these better than everyone, all dandelions included. However, when they are raised in an environment that is not conducive to orchidness, and this is why I can't just say it's not just a bad environment. And this is where I really urge you to either watch one of the TED Talks with uh, Thomas Boyce, or any of his talks, really, I think where he gets into the history of him researching this, or read his books, he talks about it there too, is this is not necessarily a, we're not talking about abusive environments, we're not talking about full on neglect, um, although those are obviously horrible, but those tend to be horrible for all people. Um, but, you know, we're talking about what I think in modern terms might be described as eh, typical parenting in some circles. And in those cases, these kids who are orchids struggle um, lifelong. They have lower life satisfaction, uh, lower emotional intelligence, lower success in relationships, lower physical health. And that is often highly linked to that stress response, right? The more we experience toxic stress, that is linked to all sorts of physical health responses later in life, but also lower mental health. So they often struggle with anxiety and depression more. And this seems to be above and beyond a genetic risk factor for that. So this environment is really, really important. And so when we explain to people that yes, they're stressed out. And so the best thing we can do is help them calm. And if we want to teach them, punishing them in that moment or doing anything negative 
that will harm them more is just going to lead to more stress. So the goal for us is to say, yeah, our job is just to get through this moment. She's, you know, you're, my child's having a hard time. They're not meaning to give you a hard time. They're not. And then we're going to work on what they need to learn after the fact. And so, yes, I am going to teach them. Thank you very much. But it's not going to be in a way that actually causes more stress. So hopefully that can help a bit. And if you can explain to people these outcomes, sometimes that can help people understand too, especially family members who really want to be supportive. If they understand the reasoning and the biology and the research around it, that can really help them kind of be like, okay, I may have to modify here a bit. And it can feel less offensive to them because some of that always comes from people saying, well, I did it this way and you need to do it the same way that I do. So hopefully, Jordan, that please let me know if that actually answered your question um, on with respect to that. So we're going back here. Uh, Richard is overexcited, hyper-like behavior, part of being an orchid. My daughter is basically never calm, either tantruming or running around, not staying still. And the more anxious I am, the more of this. So it's not inherently something that can be, you don't see it in all orchids. I haven't seen that in the literature. I've certainly seen it in families who have an orchid. Now, um, I never want to be the one that it may be that you're looking at that young age at just normal hyper excitability of children. Um, most children, I think I, I wrote a paper once and had to look up the stat and I believe by three years of age, was it? 80% uh, of kids would meet the diagnosis of ADHD. So we do live in a culture where we've kind of dampered that down. And so very hyper engaged behavior can actually be a very normal human trait at that age. Um, but it also could be a sign of that dysregulation as well. So there's dysregulation in the negative sense of tantruming, but there can also be a dysregulation on the positive sense. And that may be something that comes with time. It may be something you want to work on, um, helping them calm. And of course, if you are anxious, it may be a response to that anxiety, right? That lack of co-regulation that can be happening. And so I would say potentially, again, with our orchids, one of the first things we can do is work on ourselves because we may not be able to change how quickly they respond to something like that, but it can you know, work if you are learning how to stay calm and sit down and physically calm. And I think it's that physical space that's so important is, you know, when our kids are in an environment where we are anxious and we're pacing, there's there's an energy to that that comes out and they pick up. They are so good at picking up on nonverbal cues. And that is something to remember is that if you think your face did not betray that flash of annoyance, no, it did. And they picked up on it right away and they're responding to that. So sometimes just the change you need to make is acknowledging all of those things to your orchids so that they don't react to things they don't know are happening. So let me give you an example. Um, I often find, at least with my orchid and with others that I've seen, that if I get kind of that flash of annoyance at something like we just stopped and in the car and then two seconds later, I got to go pee. And you're like, oh. I just want to get somewhere. That flash, even if I don't say that, if I just go, that there will be picked up. And orchids will internalize that. They will feel worse. And the worse they feel, the more the behavior comes out as dysregulated because that's what happens for everyone. That's just, that's not an orchid trait. That's everyone. But the degree to which it can happen for orchids can be greater. So the more they feel that way, the worse they're going to behave. Um, some kids will act out more. Some will get more hyper trying to bring the situation to a state that they're more comfortable with. So that hyperness may be, look, I'm going to be funny. I'm going to try and change to make you happy. Look, ah, and it, it's not working obviously, but that's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to be negative. They're trying to actually shift us out of it. So if we can sometimes just say, Hey, you know what? I, it's not you. You know what? Yeah, I had that. I know I looked annoyed. You saw it. And it was just in my head. I got to the stage of, oh, we need to get there. But you know what? I've thought about it now. And no, I don't need to get there. We're in no rush. It's not a big deal. We can stop there. So please don't worry about it. We'll find the next bathroom. You go. No problems. 
when we do that for our orchids and we acknowledge those, not only can it help in that moment with their dysregulation, because they then no longer have to try to bring you out of whatever they perceive you to be in, that funk, um, but also they get to model that from you. So often some of those big emotions are because these events happen and they just, they can't handle it. They feel like it's the end of the world. And that's kind of what those flashes are for us. And so when they learn that it's okay, I can think about this for a moment and scale back that initial reaction, right? We get stressed, we wanna react. But if I can wait a moment and get to a response, and that's something I always say is we, our goal is not to react, it's to respond then they can start to take that into their own lives. And it'll take time. It takes a lot of time to get there, but um, but they do. And especially with support from us and, and the patience that we have to get there. So that's really important. And I realized, I think I started a train of thought that I got veered off of and didn't say. So <laughs> I'm gonna just quickly jump back and I, please forgive me. Um, one of the things we talked about in terms of, you know, building that toolkit, for that, those later outcomes, as I was saying, they have this divergent outcomes. One of the things about heading towards that positive trajectory is that if you think about a child who regularly is struggling and we're able to calm, what we do after that is we then teach them a way of coping with it. And because the early years of life are filled with I mean, every stressor imaginable, they just go through all sorts of stress, right? Just naturally, uh, friendship stress, like relationship stress, lots of change in their lives, um, illnesses that can feel scary, all sorts of things happen, schools, struggles, it's all, the world is a scary place. And they have a lot of those experiences. And so if they're in a supportive environment where they're allowed to experience the stress, get that out with support, and then we say, okay, let's let's talk about how to handle this in the future. That child, by the time they're 18, by the time they're 15 probably, has a toolkit for handling a variety of stressors that is bigger than anything you or I have probably seen. And so they can suddenly start reacting in this ways. And so when we think about the better mental health outcomes, the greater emotional intelligence, the greater relationship skills, these all come from this toolkit being built over years and years and years. Now you compare that to an orchid who never got it. Of course they didn't. Their stress becomes toxic because they're not coping with it. Parents are adding stressor to stressor. And so they don't have the toolkit and we have those negative outcomes. Now, in the dandelion case, part of why they may get even better than the dandelions is because the dandelions aren't experiencing the stress. So we may give them some tools for handling. You know, we all talk about, oh, you know, there are moments, yeah, take your deep breath, sing a song, cuddle a teddy bear. But by and large, we're not investing the amount of time in helping them cope with this. So we're not building their toolkit quite as well. And so as they get older, the struggles they face may still come up just as great as with the orchid, but their toolkit isn't quite as big enough to handle it. So some of that seems to be kind of predicated upon that. They just are lacking that emotional intelligence, which is really what stems from all of these skills, the self-regulation, everything, that the orchids who have been in this very positive environment have. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So I see, I know we're coming up on time. I'll take one more here. Um, in your, from Claire again, in your experience with your orchid child, how do you find the line between knowing what stressful, difficult situation is one that your orchid should face and when to remove them? Is it gut instinct? That is an excellent question because that is what we so often face. I will say that I... Well, there's two things to this. First off, if my orchid has been luckily very clear, when it's too much, it's too much. And the reaction will be so huge to an event that it's like, okay, this is clearly too much right now. And it doesn't mean we're just like, well, clearly we're never going to do this kind of class again. That's not it either. It means that there needs to be either a bit of growth to feel more comfortable with it, or we need to look at, okay, what skills are needed to feel comfortable there and then we work on those. So that's, you know, I will often know pretty quickly. And so I have taken my child out of classes on day one. I've taken them out after two days and I've done it after a couple weeks. It depends upon how long it goes and I have to see 
her reaction. She's also older now, in which case she can have that beautiful awareness of having a really hard time. And once she's calm and we talk about it, she's like, no, you know what? I think I'm ready to try it again. I think I can do it. And this is one of the, the pros of orchids is that I call them reflectively self-aware is that when you get beyond that stress, so it feels like they don't, they don't manage their emotions at all in the big moments, but when you get beyond them, they are often incredibly well-versed in understanding their emotions and talking about them in ways that are helpful. And that's a really good strength. So if you can get beyond that urge and get to that responsiveness and that calmness, that kind of, um, that kind of emotional discussion uh, can really be helpful. And so there's that. The other part is always looking at what can you do to make the situation more bearable. So if you're in a school, for example, say you're starting a new school, if you're allowed to be there, if there's a parent's room that you can stay in for the time, you may say, okay, that's hard, but what about if I'm in there and you can come to me and check in? That might make it less stressful at the beginning. And so you can kind of cater it based on what's there. And if it's a school that may say, nope, sorry, you've got to leave, you may say, well, then I know that's too much. So you are walking a fine line, but you know, it's always kind of what are the support systems in place there? And then I often think of it as, okay, is this necessary? So if I look at a, um, you know, we did as an example, my daughter did karate when she was four or five and she walked into one class. I, I'd signed her up. They'd already started, but they said it didn't matter. She could join at any point came in to like 35 people in a big room. They were all lined up and then they just started doing the moves. Some guy came up and just started moving her body to try and go with it while everyone's yelling at each move. And it took her about five minutes to run out to my arms, just repeating too much, too much, too much, too much, too much. And we called it because also she doesn't need to do karate at that stage. That that was a bonus one. So who cares? Now, something that may be more important, um, you know, especially if your kid has to go to school or you have to go back to work and you need a childcare situation, those are things that you can't just willy nilly be like, I don't have to do that. So then it becomes looking at how do we find an environment that's suitable and how do we teach the skills needed to go into that. So I think there's a lot of layers to that. And I hope that actually kind of answers it because I think it's really important to think about what is needed in that moment. So um, on that note, I want to say I had this, which I am so thankful. Thank you so much, Jessica. This is I, you know, I appreciate all of you guys showing up today to get questions asked. I know you know, as a parent to an orchid who's older now, how little support and awareness there really is. And I did find something like the highly sensitive person didn't really define my daughter as well because of these dichotomies and stuff. So I have really benefit from researching and coming to understand the orchid framework of thinking because, you know, I do think that when we understand what's happening at the biological level, how we approach it, it opens up a, an array of ways to approach it because we can see it's about the stress reactivity and, and how we calm our kids can be quite variable. How they need to be calmed, how we teach them, all these things are, um, are, are so child dependent, dyad dependent, family dependent, but there's all sorts of ways to do it. And so we don't have to feel like there is one way. And when we see our kids behaving in totally different ways, that also can be really okay. So. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I will, if you're on my my kind of orchid list for, for the freebie, I will be sending this link out uh, so that you can come back and watch this again as needed. And um, yeah, I hope to see you. I hope to be doing this maybe again sometime in the future. And I hope to see you all soon. So thank you. Bye.